Now let's turn to looking at some applications of the Nash Equilibrium. The first is what we call the traditional prisoner's dilemma. We'll talk about what makes it a prisoner's dilemma here in a minute. Uh, but here we have two players, player one and player two. Each of them has two options, either A or B. Now player one gets to pick our row, either row A or row B. Player two gets to pick the column, either A or B. And we can see here what we call the game matrix describing the four different possible outcomes. If both play A, that is we end up in the first row, row marked A, in the first column, marked A, then player one and player two each get one. If they both choose B, end up with row B, column B, then player one and player two each get two. If player one chooses A, well player two chooses B, we're in row A, column B, that means player one would get three, while player two would get nothing. Or we swap it if player two is the one that plays A, while player one plays B. Player one gets nothing, player two gets three. So now how we find a Nash equilibrium is by looking for best responses and then finding um, some outcome in which everyone is playing their best response. The way I like to do this is by putting arrows down pointing toward best responses. So let's say that player one is thinking about what they could do. Now they don't know what player two is going to do. This is a simultaneous game. But they say, well, if player two were to play A, what's the best thing I can do? Well, if I play A, I get one. If I play B, I get nothing. Well, one is better than nothing, so player one's best response is to play A. So here in column A, indicating that player two would pick A, player one's best response would be to also pick A. So we point toward that first row. Now if player two were to play B, once again player one doesn't know what player two is going to do, but if they think they might play B, player one would say, well if I play A I get three, if I play B I get two, so it's better to play A because three is better than two. So now the best response arrows are telling us that it actually doesn't matter what player two does. Player one's best response is to play A. This is what we call a dominant strategy. That is, A is the best response in all cases. That means it's the dominant strategy. Player B, uh, no, option B, or strategy B, would be considered the dominated strategy. That is, it is never the best response. So it's been dominated by the other strategy that's available. Now, player two would go through a similar line of reasoning. Would say, well, I don't have any control over player one, so maybe they're going to play A. If they play A, I either get one by playing A or nothing by playing B. Well, I'd, I'd rather play A. So in that case, player two would choose column A. So I have an arrow here pointing toward the left indicating that. If player one plays B, though, player two could play A and get three, or could play B and get two. Well, three is better than two, so in that case, player two would want to choose A as well. So once again, A is a dominant strategy for player two, just as it was for player one. That being the case, we have a pretty strong reason to believe they'd both play A. And sure enough, it ends up our Nash equilibrium, that is where all the arrows seem to be pointing toward, is where both play A. That is, both players playing A indicates that it is a case in which both players are playing their best response. Right? If player one plays A, player two's best response is also to play A. If player two plays A, player one's best response is to also play A. And that would be the case here. That defines this Nash equilibrium. All the players are playing their best response. Now this is a prisoner's dilemma. The way we know that is first there's only one Nash equilibrium. Um, secondly, that Nash equilibrium is not Pareto optimal. A Pareto optimal case is a case where it's impossible for us to help one party without hurting another party. But here we notice it is actually perfectly possible for us to help both player one and player two at exactly the same time. And that would be if both of them played B. They'd both walk away with two instead of both walking away with one. Both getting two is better than both getting one, since we're assuming the number to be a positive number here. So, that being the case, we ended up with an outcome that is not good, right? that it is not Pareto optimal. We could actually have made both players better off if we had done something else. And another point about what makes this a prisoner's dilemma is that it is supported by these dominant strategies that we mentioned before. So that's what we need for prisoner's dilemma. One Nash equilibrium. The Nash equilibrium cannot be Pareto optimal. That is, there must be a way to improve the outcome for both players. And also, it, that Nash equilibrium must be supported by dominant strategies. That is, strategies that are always the best response regardless of what the other player does. Here's another type of game we call a coordination game. We'll, We'll get into why it's called a coordination game in a little bit. 
So here my, my wife and I, the story is that the two of us are trying to figure out where we're going to go eat. Um, one possibility is Chipotle, the other one is McDonald's. Here it's a simultaneous game, which means neither of us actually knows where the other one is going to go, we just know it's going to be either Chipotle or McDonald's. We're trying to figure out what's going to happen in this case. Now we're assuming that both my wife and I like to eat with the other. Um, it's certainly true for me, I like to eat with her. I'm not so sure that it's true for her, I like to eat with me, but let's, for the sake of assumption, say that that's the way it is. So let's say that for each of us, the happiness we get from eating with the other person is worth five. What that five means, it's not entirely clear, but let's just say it's worth five. We give happiness units or something like that. Um, but we have different tastes in food. Right? So we like eating with each other, worth five for each of us, but my wife prefers Chipotle food, which to her, eating that food gives her, say, two happiness points, while I prefer McDonald's food. Eating that gives me two happiness points. Then we look at all the different possible outcomes. Right? So if, say, I go to Chipotle while my wife goes to McDonald's, it's a terrible outcome. Each of us has zero, because we're eating alone, so we don't get any points of happiness from eating with each other, and we're also eating food we don't like, so we don't get any happiness points from eating food we like. On the other hand, if we have a case, say, where we both go to Chipotle, we each get five points from going to Chipotle, plus my wife gets two points from eating Chipotle. So she would get seven, I'd get five. Now let's go through and look for best responses. Let's suppose, let's think first from my wife's perspective, right? Suppose she guesses that maybe I'm going to Chipotle. In that case, her best response is to also go to Chipotle. Seven, after all, is far better than the zero she would get if she went to McDonald's and ended up eating alone. Now, if she thought that I was going to McDonald's, her best response would be to come to McDonald's. After all, um, eating Chipotle is good, she would get two points from that, but she'd much rather get the five points from eating McDonald's with me. Now, an important point we notice here is that there is no dominant strategy. Sometimes going to Chipotle is the right choice, sometimes McDonald's is the right choice for my wife. Now, in my case, we end up with a very similar result. Right? If I think my wife is going to Chipotle, I also want to go to Chipotle, because I'd rather get five points from eating with my wife than two points from eating McDonald's by myself. Now, if I believe my wife is going to McDonald's, I certainly want to go to McDonald's, because I'd much rather get the seven points from eating McDonald's, that's two points, with my wife, that's another five, a total of seven, I'd much rather get that than the zero from eating Chipotle by myself. So this is a case where, once again, no dominant strategy. Sometimes Chipotle is the right choice, sometimes McDonald's is the right choice. Now let's look for Nash Equilibria. Nash Equilibrium is any case in which both players are playing their best response. We see here there are actually two of those. The first is if we both go to Chipotle. If my wife goes to Chipotle, I also, my best response is to go to Chipotle. If I'm at Chipotle, my wife's best response is to come to Chipotle. So that establishes that this is, in fact, a Nash Equilibrium. But at the same time, both of us eating at McDonald's is also a Nash Equilibrium. If I'm at McDonald's, my wife wants to come to McDonald's. If my wife is at McDonald's, I want to go to McDonald's. So this would be another Nash Equilibrium. So this is a case where Nash Equilibrium isn't going to give us a very strong prediction as to which of these is going to come about. All we can really say is that we're going to try to end up going the same place. Now this is a case where um, actually a little bit of coordination and planning ahead of time can drastically change the outcome of the game. After all, if I call my wife and I say, hey, let's meet at Chipotle, that's what we're going to do, as long as she believes I'm not lying to her. Um, but at the same time, if I were to call and say, let's go to McDonald's, we would end up at McDonald's. Right? So coordination really determines the outcome of this game. That's why we call it a coordination game. There are actually lots of coordination games out there in reality. Um, they actually affect us virtually every day. For example, what side of the road do you drive on? Now we know it depends on where you are. If, say, you live as I do in the United States, we all drive on the right. right? Whereas if you go to the United Kingdom, you better drive on the left or you're going to run into problems. Right? So it ends up it doesn't actually matter whether you drive on the left or the right, as long as you do the same thing everyone else does. Right? So this is a case where coordination is really what drives the outcome of the game. We have all agreed here in the US we're going to drive on the right, there in the UK they're going to drive on the left. It doesn't particularly matter which one you do as long as you do it in the right place. Here's another type of game we call matching pennies. Um, pl the idea of this game is player one and player two each have a penny. Um, and they can decide, do they want to reveal a head or a tail? So they're not flipping, it's not random. They get to decide, do I pick a head or do I pick a tail? Right. So um, the rules of the game say that if both of the players pick the same side of the coin, that is both heads or both tails, then player one wins and gets both pennies. So player one is up a penny, so either score is one, player two is down a penny, we see their score is negative one. 
On the other hand, if the two play different sides of the coin, so one picks heads, the other picks tails, then player two wins and gets both pennies. So player two is up a penny, player one is down a penny. So now let's look for our Nash equilibrium. Well, remember, we start with best responses. Let's think about player one. If they think player two is going to play heads, player one certainly wants to play heads. After all, matching is what wins it for player one. Now, if player two plays tails, player one wants to play tails. Once again, matching is what wins it for player one. Now let's think about player two's choice. If they believe that player one is going to play heads, player two's best response would be to play tails. After all, they don't want to match. They want the two to be different, and that's how they win. Now, if they believe that player one's going to play tails, then in that case, the best response is to play heads. Hmm. Now we go looking for Nash equilibrium, and we find out there is none. There actually is no case where both players are playing their best response. If player one is playing their best response, say both as heads, then it must be the case that player two is not playing their best response, because they could have done better by playing tails and ending up winning the game. Right? So this is a case where there is no Nash equilibrium whatsoever, where always one of the players could have played the game better. Another game that's structured very much this way is um, Rock, Paper, Scissors. It's just a little bit more complicated because there are three options instead of two, but it's still the same basic game underlying things. Yeah. Now, one point, with this type of game, it ends up the best thing you can do is try to be random. So, try to be as unpredictable as possible, and that makes it more likely you're going to win. At least you have a 50-50 shot. But as soon as you become predictable, the other player is going to beat you every time. Here's a similar game I like to call the Matrix game. We have Agent Smith and Neo. Agent Smith... Firing a gun at Neo would like to kill him, so Neo dying would be a positive outcome for Agent Smith. Um, Neo dying would naturally be a negative outcome for Neo. He would rather survive. So this is a case where it's actually exactly matching pennies. Agent Smith is always going to be trying to fire in the same direction as they believe Neo is going to dodge. Well, at the same time, Neo is going to try to dodge away from the way that they believe Agent Smith is going to fire. So this is another game, just like matching pennies, there will be no Nash equilibrium in this case. What about a case like this? This is a case where there's really just one really bad outcome. If player 1 and player 2 both choose B, then they both get nothing. But as long as one of them, at least, at least one of them, chooses A, they both get 3. Well, in this case, it ends up, right, we can go look at best responses. If player 2 were to play A, player 1's best response is either A or B. Both A and B can count as best responses, so I'm not going to bother labeling it. Um, if player 2 plays B, player 1's best response is very clearly playing A, because 3 is better than nothing. Player 2 is in exactly the same boat. As long as player 1 plays A, it doesn't matter what player 2 does. Either A or, one, a or B would be considered a best response. If player 1 plays B, then player 2's best response is clearly A. So that being the case, it ends up there are three Nash equilibria. If both play A, that's a Nash equilibrium. They're both playing the best response. They, neither of them could have improved the outcome for themselves by changing what they did. Same thing if, say, player 1 plays A, player 2 plays B, or vice versa. As long as somebody's playing A, we're in a Nash equilibrium here. Now I consider this rather boring case, where it doesn't matter what player 1 or player 2 does. Um, everybody's going to get 3. Well, in this case, if you're thinking, uh, it feels like they're all Nash equilibria, you're absolutely right. Because that means it doesn't matter what the other player does, anything is the best response, because there is no better response. Right? Everything is equally good. Right? So in this case, they're all considered Nash equilibria. Not a particularly interesting case, because this isn't much of a game, if the outcome is going to be the same regardless of what we do, but it's still a theoretical possibility. You could possibly have then one Nash Equilibrium is in a Prisoner's Dilemma, or there are other games that have one Nash Equilibrium that isn't a Prisoner's Dilemma. We could have two, as in the coordination game we saw. We could have three, we could have four, or we could have none, as in matching pennies.